going to explore a curious problem and it has several sides to it. One thing I'd like to explore is this curious quote in Plato's Symposium where he talks about the object of love. That's the loved. And in the symposium, Socrates' teacher, Diotima, corrects Socrates by pointing out that what he thought the thing loved was, was in fact not the case at all. And so she corrects him with this curious phrase, which I'd like to look at. For the thing loved, the object of love, is in fact beautiful, dainty, perfect, and blessed. Another translation of dainty is delicate. Now, the object that they're talking about is the nature of beauty itself. And in the symposium, that's encountered in an all-enveloping vision into the nature of reality itself, or truth itself. To call it dainty or delicate seems very curious, because there's nothing fragile about it. It can't be that sense, because it's overwhelming and powerful. And so the question is, how can these three terms be met? How can, they, how can they be related? What meaning is there in them? So this beautiful itself right, has three terms. Delicate or dainty, right, perfect and blessed, or divine. Now, that overwhelming experience of beauty itself is a luminous experience. And it's described, and people can describe it, in so many ways. And you have to develop a vocabulary for it. Now, let's assume we have established a vocabulary for it by collecting all the terms that people might use to describe this overwhelming experience. All right, here we have them in here. Here they are. All the terms, here they are. We're gonna put them all in here. Oh, we have a question about it. Is there any special way in which these sh should be combined? Is there any way they should be singled out? Is there any priority that some terms should be used ahead of others? Or is it just simply being overwhelmed with an object of beauty and we pour on the object of beauty all of these terms and in that way we feel that we've described the beauty, the thing that is so remarkable to us. But no, we don't want to do that. We want to look at these terms and see in some way if there is an order and a hierarchy to them. Is there an order? Can they be arranged hierarchically, higher Lana? Is there some order and hierarchy to the terms? Is it possible that with an order and a hierarchy they can come together in some intelligible way so that we just don't have to have a handful of terms or a bag full of terms and dump them on this experience with all the indiscriminate whatness that might advance our feelings about it. Next, if there is this experience, and if it can be made intelligible, then there's a need for order, hierarchy, patterns, and then that's possible, it can enter into dialogue. Then we can use it. Then we can use it. We can bring it together. We can have an ordered 
hierarchical set of terms which we can use to communicate with one another, and perhaps we can use them, and of course this is rather important, as a way of understanding what we may in fact, what we may encounter. And it may be that the very act of understanding it with such precision may in fact be a precursor or set up certain conditions for the experience itself. Now, what's curious about this word, light, or divine radiance, is that even though it's one word, it actually admits of different kinds. Now look here, here we have one right here. Look at this. The luminous precursor of divine light says, does it not, that there's something luminous before the divine light? Well, that's rather odd unless there are different kinds of this radiance. And if they are, is there some way of talking about them so we can separate one from the other and see their necessity? Is it possible then to going back into Plato and make sense of this thing we started out with? How can we use these terms, delicate, perfect, blessed, in some ordered way? because that's what Socrates does through Diotima. Therefore, what I'd like to do is to go into the theology of Proclus and just do one small section. And I Xerox some sheets for you from the Thomas Taylor translation. And so I'm going to take you through what I think is a way to approach the subject. Now, in order to get into the subject, we have to talk about this divine radiance, we're talking about, we're going to take that term out, what is the nature then of the divine? That's what we want to take a look at. See, that's what we want to take a look at. We want to see whether Proclus orders it in such a way, if we can follow the way he orders it, maybe in the end of our search, looking at the nature of the divine, we can go back here and see what's what is there about the strange word delicate and dainty that makes sense? Because right on the surface it doesn't make sense at all. Well, from Plato we know that everything divine is, has three qualities. Again, we can set it out in this way. And luckily enough, The beautiful, the good, and the wise. The basic assumption of all of this is that the divine is not something transcendent, which means it doesn't touch anything else, but remains aloof and apart from our everyday existence. But it must show itself in some way. The reflection of these three, these three things, the beautiful, good, and the wise, must have some penetrating influence in our domain. When it does, then we can change those terms to goodness, wisdom, and beauty. Ah. Same triad, only now we can see that if it pervades, if it pervades our universe, then it pervades also all the progressions of the gods. If this is the realm of the intelligible, and if it pervades everything in the intelligible, it must also pervade what Proclus calls all the gods. Now, we have a view of God which is not going to be useful because 
Proclus' idea of God is a principle. It's a principle. But it's not an intellectual principle in the way we usually use the term. It's a principle that has a certain vitality. Right? It's what we might call a vivifying principle right? that has a life, that has a vitality to it, has an intelligibility to it. That's what they call a God. And they may exhibit different aspects and therefore they get different names. But essentially, it's a principle that has a vitality. Now, let's see if we can go into Proclus. And I outlined a few things here. Now notice what we're going to do. We're going to first take goodness and we're going to see what Proclus says about it. See? Now, put it in another way. You can always work Proclus backwards and it makes more sense. Is there something that preserves things, that gives things a substance, a subsistence? He's going to say that resides in something higher and it manifests itself on the lower. And he's also going to say that this kind of goodness exists on his, as a summit. Right? As a summit. And it's a vitality that overflows and therefore it fills all subordinate natures. See, it comes, it spills itself all over and therefore it penetrates into our domain. And this thing, which is goodness, pre-exists in every single order to the degree that the first principle in any order is analogous to the first principle, which is this. Now this is a concept he has, which is really something like this. <clears throat> it's vertical and horizontal. In any order, in any higher order, it has an origin and it also shows up in a series of terms. The first or the leading figure in the series of terms is always analogous to this highest expression in any order. That's what he means. So it pre-exists in every order. In every order, you have something that stands apart from it, that's responsible for the order. We could say that in terms of la another language and say, in any set, the principle that orders the set stands above it. But all the members in the set, there's always the first member in that order. And that bears a certain relationship to all the succeeding members. And therefore, it has an imminent and a transcendent quality. Now, if you follow this then, then as a result of this, we want to see something, this goodness. It spills over. And he wants to say about this goodness that there is nothing more perfect or good. This is going to be, therefore, a goodness that has a perfection. Now, we're going to see if we can collect all of these terms, remember, and we're going to put them in here as the sum set of terms that are used to describe the very nature of the thing, beauty itself, which is nothing other than the nature of the divine in one of its aspects. So let's take a look. Now, There are three elements of the good. So now look here, or goodness. So he's going to get three here. Why three? Why is the triangle a good example of what he does in his thinking? Because when he reflects on things, he has one principle, and that principle is for anything, for anything to progress, for anything to flow, for anything to be generated, 
it presupposes that there's going to be some principle of likeness. And that's a mean term. So therefore, there's always going to be something here that's going to be shared with both. So A is to B is B is to C. And that is a mean analogy. A is to B, as B is to C. That must be there in order to fulfill the condition of likeness, because any two things for Plato, or for anyone, in order to be connected needs a third thing to join them. That third thing is a mean term. Now, going back to our concept of goodness, you need three things. If it's really good, it has three qualities. It's desirable, it's sufficient, and it's perfect, right? D, desirable. Desirable, by its very nature, it must be desired. I'll just put a D there because it's pretty good. It's sufficient, it doesn't need anything else. I want to put an S, right? And you know the last term is going to be perfect. We have to see how he talks about those three terms because we're going to go through this whole thing and discover all of those terms. Now, let's go to the text, have a little fun. Now, I am on uh, page 72. Three most principal elements of the good are the desirable, the sufficient, and the perfect. Just what we have. Why? For it's necessary that it should convert all things to itself, fill all things, in no respect deficient. So if it's going to convert all things to itself, it has to fill all things. So, let's fill all things and convert all things to itself. Whenever we say and deal with this idea that it both fills, right, then we have an overflow, right? we have an overflow, fills all things, converts to itself, that's a return. Whenever that takes place on the highest level, that's that curious word, essence. Sometimes we use the word, we see. So built into the very idea of goodness, the very idea of goodness, is that it, it has the quality or the capacity to fill things, and as a result of that, it converts all things to itself. And now, look here. All things, therefore, are going to desire the good, because they're going to be converted to it. Now, we're going to pull out terms for the desirable. Please look, I'm on page 73. We can go right through this together. Now, I'm going to hit some words, and you can see how we can fill them in. The desirable is this, as the supplier of light proceeds by his rays into secondary nature, plural. Right? Whatever, see? Goodness is desirable. What does it do? How does it function? It's the supplier of light. It proceeds by, these, by its rays into secondary natures. Therefore, hey, you and I, secondary natures, we can get it. Right? That's what it is. Right? Therefore, it's a supplier of light. It converts the eye, it converts the eye to itself. Anything that's good, what happens? We're attracted to it, right? We're, we're filled with it. We, re we want to look at it. We want to see it. Therefore, it converts the eye to itself and it causes us to light up and to resemble that which we seek. Right? It conjoins, brings us with the thing that we think is good, and it has a alluring and draws upward all things. That's what the good, anything you want to call good, that's what it does. It's alluring, it draws us towards it, it draws us upward, and in this case, if it draws us upward, what's above goodness but the good? So it draws all to the good itself. Now, if it does that, right, 
uh, it does this by, by its own proper illuminations. It's everywhere present to all things. That's how it does it. Now look here. This is kind of essential for Proclus. Right? It does this all the time. It's not, a, it's not an act of particular grace. That's going on continuously, but we don't notice it. Therefore, the game is to try to see if in, case, if in fact it's the way he describes it by becoming aware of what he says exists all the time. Now, <clears throat> well, that's desirable. How about sufficient? I'm at the bottom of 73. Hey, if it's sufficient, if it is sufficient, it doesn't need anything. It's full of power. In every threesome that Proclus creates, you will always find the second term is power. Power, energy, vitality, something of that nature, right? a vitality. And sure enough, we have it here, right? The sufficient power proceeds to all things, extends to all. And insofar as it extends to all, this power can also, by the way, be called the gift of the gods. Right? That's what he calls it. So he extends it to all, all get it, therefore it's a gift of the gods. Sometimes, therefore, in other works, it's called a reflection of the will of the gods because it's a gift. Gift presupposes some kind of will. Now, if that's the case, that's the case, then we pull the two together. Then the desirable being firmly established, surpassing the whole of things, arranging all things about itself, the, the, the sufficient begins the progression and multiplication of all good. Hey, since it's sufficient, there's a stability of divine natures. Right. If there's a stability of such a divine nature, it's full of goodness. All beings are therefore benefited, abide in it, proceed from it, and being reunited to their principles, they're essentially right, absorbed in it, together with it. Now, going now to power. Notice the way he talks about power on 74. Power, therefore, is the is the subsistence of nature similar to themselves. They find the same intellectual genre. They come from the same class. And they imitate the beings prior to the souls. Now that may not be clear. Uh, there is this principle which always takes place, we mentioned before, that in any progression there's always a likeness. The likeness always presupposes a kinship between the thing that's generating and the thing generated. Now, we left out perfect, and that's what we need. Well, here it is at the bottom of 74. He doesn't ignore it. All things, therefore, desirable of goodness, generate and proceed into the generations. The third thing, the perfect. What does it do? It always, always does the same thing. In every single function, this power, whatever he puts here in the third place, must always be able to then take that power and use it to return to the source. That's always the case. <clears throat> These terms may vary. Relations are going to be the same. Relations are going to be the same. Let's see if that's the case. But the third thing, the perfect, is convertive. See, it converts of the whole of things and circularly collects them to their causes. See, it returns it to its cause. And this is accomplished by divine intellectual and psychical and physical perfection. All things participate of such a conversion. They return to their principles. And the perfect, therefore, is mingled from the desirable and the sufficient. And it's mingled with it. It's a result of it. It's mingled with it. So, see? 
have that same property that we had before. One, two, three. Those together bring us to the perfect. This, of course, would be power. Huh? And necessarily, the highest would be uh, that wonderful thing um, which takes on desirable, but it's also the divine, and therefore you return to the desirable of the divine for Proclus. I'm on page 74. All things participate by conversion. The perfect, the perfect is mingled from the desirable and the sufficient. The desirable therefore establishes all things, comprehends them in itself. The, the sufficient excites them into progressions and generations. See? Excites them into progressions and generations because it's pre this is always productive generative. It can go in two ways. In every single structure that he develops, it has this triadic sense to it. We can look at it here and see it. This must be the cause. This must be the power. This must be the generating, uh, returning and it returns this way, but it also can generate the next order below itself. So it always has these two aspects to it. And therefore it can generate by going into what follows from it or what precedes it, returns to it or follows from it. And that's what he does. Let's see how he does it. See? The sufficient then excites them into progressions and generations. That's the sufficient. And the perfect consumedly leads progressions to conversions and convolutions. And through these causes, these three causes, the goodness of the gods fixing their unical power, right, the, un the in unity of their power and authority of its proper hypostasis in this triad. Therefore, goodness fits in this higher triad. So there we have it, here's goodness, all right? Way up on top. Now, we just then go for the next two and fill it in. The next one is wisdom, the last one's going to be beauty. Huh? Here we are. So now he's going to look at the same structure that we use, we can use again for wisdom. It's not gonna be any different. The structure is going to be the same. The terms will vary. Now, uh, I'm on page 75. Wisdom, that's the intelligence of the gods. It's actually the fullest development or hyparxis of their intelligence. It's an ineffable knowledge. It's united to the object of its knowledge. And it's the intelligible union of the gods. That's are all brought together. Now, notice he goes back to the symposium. I say then that Diotima in the banquet is of the opinion that wisdom is full of that which is known. It possesses the intelligible. That's what it does, it possesses the intelligible. It has three aspects. Wisdom is triadic, I'm in 76. It's, it's, uh, it's full of being, truth, and generative of intellectual truth. Right? And it perfects all things. So what is it? There we have it, three things. Being, it's gonna be full of being going to be full of being. See, wisdom, right? We have wisdom. There's going to be three things. We can call, let's get another one. Uh, we can put it in here. Wisdom is three things. The top one is going to be being. It's going to be the primary cause. It's going to be being. The second is going to be the generator of divine truth. And the last is going to be that which perfects all things. 
and it perfects all of those intellectual natures that are in energy. Where does it get the energy? Here. So therefore, wisdom, therefore, is going to use this energy. It's going to be perfected. It's going to be perfected by returning to its source. And that's the way to read Proclus. Hence, it's full of being and truth. It's generative intellectual truth. It's perfective of intellectual natures that are in energy and itself possesses a stable power. For this wisdom indeed is full of divine goodness, generates divine truth, perfects all things prior to itself. It follows the same order, the same structure. Now we are where we want to be. We've rushed through this so that we can get into this section on beauty. I'm on 76. We're going to use the same thing. We're going to choose the same thing. We'll clean it up, make a little room, get our chalk, go to work. Consider the beautiful. What is it? And why can we say it subsists in the gods? It's said to be beautiful in respect to its form, which is good. It's an intelligible beauty. It's beauty itself. It's a cause of beauty to other things or all things. Now, he has an expression here that I would like to pause on. It subsists in the intellectual place. It proceeds from this. To all the general, all, the, all of the gods, it illuminates their super essential unities, and all the essence is suspended from these unities as far as the apparent vehicles of the gods. Let's take a look at it. See, what he's, this is what he's saying. The highest term is the good of the one. Metaphysically. The one thing that must be presupposed, the one thing that must be presupposed that follows from this is oneness. Oneness is a unity. This thing that we're talking about, which is divine, see, if it's divine, it's going to have those qualities we were talking about previously. Being a basic energy, power energy, generative power, and an intellect. This is our basic, now look here. This is experienced as beauty itself. This is experienced as beauty itself. Why does it presuppose unity? Because everyone who experiences has to say it has these three qualities. That it's real, it's got power, and it's mindful. Not as separate things, but as a, presupposes a unity. What does that mean? If you can distinguish something, being power, energy, and intellect in an experience, and you're saying those things are some way to intimately together in that thing that it presupposes they are together as a unity. Therefore, a unity must be the condition for such a state. And if it's the condition, it's what is prior. If it's prior, then it has a higher status. But unity or oneness can only exist if there is, in fact, a one or a good. Therefore, see, uh, our colleague is going to now going to talk about the divine, right? With those three terms, beautiful, wise, and good. Now, uh, what's curious about this, or goodness, these changes, those to goodness, remember. Um, they shouldn't be arranged this way, but I'll, I'll change that later for a good reason. All right. 
I'm on this one phrase, it proceeds from this to all the genera of the gods. It illuminates their unities, super essential unities, and all the essences suspended from these unities as far as the apparent vehicles to the gods. All right, see, it illuminates the unities, that's here. It illuminates the unities and all the essences, essence is another word for unity, that are suspended from it, that are suspended from it, that are suspended from it. What's suspended from it is this very thing we're talking about. Now, we're after beauty itself, divine beauty. Uh, now he's going to set up a curious threesome on several levels. Let's see how he does it. I'm on page 77. Divine beauty. It's the supplier of divine hilarity, familiarity, friendship. There's your three. It's the supplier of it. That's not what it is. It's the supplier of it. Through this, the gods are united to rejoice in each other, admire and are delighted in communicating with each other, and in their mutual replenishments, since uh, they do not desert the order in which they are always allotted in the distributions of themselves. Therefore, what state are they in? As a result of divine hilarity, familiarity, and friendship, which he calls the supplier. Divine beauty is the supplier of these three things. As a result of these things being in place, the gods therefore are one, united, they rejoice in other, they admire, and are delighted in communicating with each other. Got them? What are they? Divine hilarity, familiarity, and friendship. What does that do? As a result of that, the gods are united to and rejoice in each other, admire, and are delighted in communicating with each other. Next sentence, and here we have the term we've been looking for. Plato also delivers three indications of this beauty in the banquet. The delicate, for the perfect, and that which is most blessed, he accedes to the beautiful through the participation of goodness. Ah, right? Plato also indicates, right, three indications of this beauty in the banquet, that banquet, of course, of the symposium. He denominates, or names, the delicate for the perfect, that which is most blessed. Ah, the delicate is that which is most perfect. Well, that was here. The most perfect is here. That's what he's calling the delicate. What we in our translation call dainty. That's what he's calling it. Indeed, denominating it the delicate for the perfect and that which is most blessed Right? Accedes to the beautiful through the participation of goodness. It part, what does it do? It accedes, it accedes to the beautiful through the participation of goodness. Oh. Oh, that's what we said. That's right. But he thus speaks of it in the dialogue. That which is truly beautiful is delicate, perfect, and blessed. Ah. Oh. Ah. Delicate. Perfect, blessed. Ah, we got us three terms again. Ah, wow. One of the indications, therefore, of the beautiful is a thing of this kind, the delicate. But we may assume another indication of it from Proclus. Now he gets another three coming, all right? We're, we're not there yet, but he's going to give it to us. Um, and this is a much more interesting one uh, called the Splendid. For Plato attributes this to the beautiful. It was the, this comes, of course, from the Phaedrus. Uh, but now beauty alone has this allotment to be most splendid and most lovely. These are the things, these are the two things, therefore, to be assumed as indications of beauty. Now, let's pull it together. I now want to go to the bottom of uh, 77, see what he does. What does beauty, therefore, do? He has to now use everything he used before and talk about it as it functions. Here we are, 77. 
Beauty converts and moves all things to itself and causes them to energize enthusiastically, recalls them through love. It's the object of love, being the leader of the whole amatory series, walking on the extremities of its feet. That comes from the myth of poverty and plenty and love and exciting all things to itself through desire and astonishment. Right? That's what beauty does. It excites all things to itself through desire and astonishment. Wow! That's what it always does. But again, because it extends to secondary natures, plenitudes from itself, in conjunction with hilarity, divine facility, it's alluring, it's inflaming, elevates all things and pours on them illuminations from on high. That's what it does. It's delicate and is said to be so by Plato because what does the delicate do? It binds the whole thing. It binds this, cut, this triad. That's what it does. The delicate binds it. Well, always does. The key term always binds the other ones. Whatever is the top term always binds the others, right? Binds it to itself, always does it. Now, remember, we, we're after the, uh, the delicate. It, by, it bounds this triad and covers as with a veil the ineffable union of the gods, swims as it were on the light of forms, causes intelligible light to shine forth, that's what it does. It triggers the divine light. It causes the, the intelligible light to shine forth and announces the occult nature of goodness. Therefore, it gets three things. What is it called? Splendid, remember what we said before? Splendid, lucid, and manifest. It's splendid, it's lucid, it's clear, and it manifests itself, manifests. For the goodness of the gods is supreme now we're going general. For the goodness of the gods is supreme, most united, most united. Sometimes he calls that a hinad. Their wisdom is in a certain respect, right? Laboring, laboring to bring forth intelligible light. That's what it does. What's it do? The goodness of God is supreme. It's most united. The wisdom is in a certain, a certain respect. Now doing what? It's bringing forth. It's in labor with what? intelligible light and the first forms. But their beauty is established in the highest forms. It's the luminous precursor of divine light. And by heavens, that was the title we gave to this talk. It's the first thing that is apparent to ascending So Now he has a hierarchy. Hey, first thing, to ascending souls, they're attracted to beauty. And being more splendid and more lovely to the view and to embrace than uh, anything that brings on light or insight. Right? It's the first thing that is apparent to ascending souls. It's more splendid, more lovely to their view. And to embrace than, than uh, every bringing to light of insight or of or light itself. And when it appears, ah, it's received with astonishment. This triad, therefore, filling all things and proceeding through all things, it is certainly necessary that the natures which are filled should be converted to and conjoined with each other to the three, uh, th through kindred, though not the same, media. That's what he's done. Now we can go back now. And you can see what he's done. We can collect all of these terms, and we can say we can put them in here. We can put all the terms in here, and we can see what he's doing. What he's doing is, with a couple of principles, and the basic principle that orders his terms, right, is always the same. Certain terms presuppose others. There's always going to be a dynamic force that's going around. The dynamic force always proceeds from something here, the top of the summit. That overflows. As a consequence, there is some power. If it overflows, 
we could talk about it as a power. That power has a direction. It's not mindless intellect. That intellect then seeks both to return to its source and to generate other kinds of entities or powers. That's what he has. He has this hierarchy, precondition of terms, and then notice what he does. He has this just the way it is, and he says, well, look here. We want to see the divine nature. That's what we want to see. All right, let's go back. We can quickly scan it and put the whole thing together. All right? What is it that's in every divine nature? Every divine nature must have a beauty, right? Because every divine nature is three things. What is it? Beautiful, wise, and good. It's a mixture of beautiful, wise, and good. But when it shows itself, what is it? Uh, goodness, wisdom, and the beauty itself. Right? Beauty itself, then, is like being. It's a substance, right? The wise, therefore, is going to be a power. It's going to generate and this is going to return. All right. Notice what he's doing there for. All right. For that to for that to take place, for that to take place, it presupposes presupposes for anything. Well, it must. If everything is going to return to it, it must be three things. It must be desirable. Ah, desirable now is this one. All right. It must be sufficient. It doesn't need anything. It's not going to be drained by its pursuit. And by necessity, it's going to be perfect. So now this becomes sufficient. This becomes perfect. Then we look for the relationships between them. We have to go into our bag for new terms to fill them up. Those terms, would you agree? The desirable, therefore, is the supplier of light. It proceeds into secondary natures. Right? It converts the eye to itself. It causes it to be like the light itself, to resemble itself. It conjoins, it allures, it draws upward all the things by its own proper illuminations. That's what it's doing. All right, okay, all right. Uh, then what is the sufficient? It's full of power. Ah, ah, ah. The sufficient now is full of power. That's what we said, didn't we, before? Of course it's full of power. That's what it has to do. Since it's full of power, it proceeds to all things, extends to all things. It's a gift of the gods. It's a power, it pervades, it, pre it pretends, it goes forward, right? And oh, certainly then, if it does that, we're now with the perfect. Uh, the perfect must convert the whole all of things, the whole of things, circularly. It collects them to their causes. Their causes is what started it off. The same language, different terms. Pardon me, same relations, different terms. It circularly collects them to their causes, and this is accomplished by divine intellectual, right? That is, you can't do this, you can't return unless there's some sense of intellect, but you have to know where you're going and how to get there. So it presupposes some kind of intellect. And therefore, at the core of reality, there has to be mind. From this then, what happens? The perfect is mingled from the desirable and the sufficient. It's mingled from the two of them. That's right. And with that, mingled with the two of them, therefore, it can then be said to be a unity. The desirable, therefore, supplies and establishes all things, comprehends them in itself. Right? Desirable now comprehends them within itself because the whole thing returned upon itself with mind in it. Ah, now we go to the next one, wisdom. We're going to get another triad here, are we not? That's right, we're going to get another triad here. And we did that with being, being is full. It's the generator of divine truth. And as a consequence of that, it perfects all things since it's a divine force, returns to itself. Therefore, we go right back again. There's going to be also, with a perfect, a triad isn't there, since there's a triad within every triad, and the same dynamic takes its place. We look for it. We change the names. We see the relations are constant. Right? And so we get, would you not agree, some rather curious ones. And the further you go, you see, it's something like a... Uh, it's something like this. Uh, you have a primary triad, and then this itself becomes a triad. This is a triad. This can be a triad. This can be a triad. That can be a triad. That can be a triad. And he even has the case where you can talk about this. 
Take it out. Itself is a triad. Why? Relations are going to be constant. When he needs it, the terms will vary, and therefore he can use the vocabulary. Now, what is significant about this is that each time you do this, you progress into another tirade, your terms are lower. So instead of saying joy, you get divine hilarity. A lower term, hel fun, hilarity. So you take the terms, and if you can rank each of these terms hierarchically, each of these terms hierarchically, then in the first set, you're going to use that term, this term, and this term. Right? Now, uh, if you want to now explore this inner, right? we want to go into this now, uh, breaking it up, then we'll take this term, then we'll take this term, then we'll take this term, and assign them these spots, and therefore the terms must be, must be hierarchically arranged so we can take them in their proper sequence and order, and that allows us then to see that the whole bag of terms that we generated fit together into a unity, and there's an organizing principle to break them up and take them out. Now, while he does that, he adds, uh, he always adds something to the structure which is very significant. It's not merely a mechanical adaptation, though that's the way I'm presenting, because that's the organizing principle. So going back, therefore, to the way in which he pulls it together, uh, which I think comes very interesting when he talks about beauty on 77. Notice now, he puts in another set of terms, but you can see the terms in the way in which they're ordered. Because, therefore, beauty converts and moves all things to itself. That's the language, right? Beauty draws us to it. It converts us to the object. It causes the person, me, to be energized enthusiastically for the object of beauty. Right? It recalls them through love, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I recognize that. Oh, yeah. Recalls, recollects. Right? It's the object of love. It's the leader of a whole series of love series. That's the highest now we're talking about it. So notice in the first three, he's using the everyday language. He's elevating it. When he's elevating it, he'll use those three terms and talk about them in our system. Notice the way he now drops back. Right? But again, because it extends to secondary natures, see, now that it goes in the second tier, secondary nature, second tier. Because it extends to secondary natures, plenitudes from itself in conjunction with hilarity, divine facility, it's now alluring and flaming, elevating all things. Right? And as a consequence of that overflowing, overpowering, he calls that, that's illuminations from on high. Right? Now, Notice now we're going to look for the unique terms that he brings in. Well, you couldn't kind of guess it because this becomes his particular way of saying within a rigid structure. And because it bounds this triad on 78, the delicate, and covers as with a veil the ineffable union of the gods, swims as it were on the light of forms, causes intelligible light to shine forth and announces the occult nature of goodness. See, that's where he now goes personally and he pulls out personal terms and you have to get used to that set of terms. These are, these are general. Now he goes into his own experience and picks out those terms appropriate for his own experience and he then weaves them into his philosophy and that's the particular Procolean terms with the richness of his own personal and private experience, he now makes public and shares with us. That's what he does. See? That's what he does. Which terms? Pardon? Which terms? And because it bounds this triad, that's okay, that's, the la that's what the last term always does, pardon me, the primary term always does, it binds them. Now, it covers as with a veil the ineffable union of the gods, one. Two, 
right? It swims, as it were, on the light of forms, causes intelligible light to shine forth, announces the occult nature of goodness, and it's called the splendid, the lucid, or the manifest. That language, right, which is, it swims, as it were, on the light of forms. It causes intelligible light to shine forth. That's out of his own experience. Right. Well, that's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to bring to you tonight. I know I put you through some hard reading, but that was my goal. He's got all these words when he says that the union of the gods is inevitable. That's right. See, the union of the gods, see, that's going to be the pr divine principles, which we talked about before. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you. Another curious evening. <laughs>